The book of Ephesians, and in particular Ephesians chapter 1, is one long prayer broken up into two sections. Paul in the first uh, verses after the greetings of verse 1 and 2 begins to pray verses 3 through 14 for the church at Ephesus. And when we get to verse 15, he begins to pray specifically for the church. This is not just a prayer that is intended for us to look at it individually. It's a prayer for the church. And it's a prayer that's been proven. And so Ephesians chapter 1, beginning at verse 15, this is how my Bible reads. It says, for this reason, ever since I heard about your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for all of God's people, I have not stopped giving thanks for you. Remembering you in my prayers. I keep asking that the God of the Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious Father, may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation so that you may know him better. I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which he has called you. The riches of his glorious inheritance in his holy people and his incomparable great power for us who believe. That power is the same as the mighty strength he exerted when he raised Christ from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly realms. I want to preach this weekend using as a subject a prayer that's proven. A prayer that's proven. Pastor Clark, one Sunday after worship, a family gathered for Sunday dinner. Just about everybody who was a part of this large family was there, uncles and aunties, grandma, grandpa, cousins. And even a few of the members from the church decided to come by for Sunday dinner. When it was time for them to eat, they gathered around the table and grabbed hands. The father of the family then looked to his six-year-old son and said, hey, son, I want you to say grace today. To which the son said in response, Daddy, I would, but I don't really know what to say. At that moment, the mama blurted out, Son, just say what you didn't heard your mama say. Little boy said, All right. Everybody proceeded to bow their heads and close their eyes. And after a few moments, the little boy said, Lord, I don't know why I invited all these people to my house for dinner today. To, to tell the truth, it's hard to pray sometimes when you're unsure what you ought to be praying for next, ain't it? In my estimation, I am convinced that one of the signs of spiritual maturity is found not just in the reality that we pray, or even in the reasons for why we pray, but one of the signs that you know you are growing in your relationship with God is seen in the type of request for which you bring to God when you pray. That is to suggest that in the same way that it is important to determine when we pray or why we pray, one of the clearest indications that you are growing and maturing in the faith is seen in what we pray for. And for me, this is the angle for which I'm attempting to approach this text this weekend because I'm convinced that for many of us, this is one of the great challenges of our prayer life. Some of you under the sound of my voice for whom at times prayer has become somewhat problematic. Your consistency and commitment for praying has waned. You've lost motivation because outside of tragedy or an emergency, you don't really know what to pray for. We've been conditioned to believe that prayer is all about us as individuals. So often when we come to God in prayer, we pray prayers that sound a little like this. God, help me. God, give me. God, protect me. God, bless me. God, make me. God, forgive me. God, use me. And it never occurs to us that one of the ways to unlock a new level in prayer and develop a deeper, more meaningful connection with God is found in our ability not just to pray individual prayers, but to see prayer as an opportunity to engage in intercessory prayers that include the corporate body of Christ. 
because of what I've discovered is one of the what you ask for in prayer can tell you a lot about your heart and your priorities. And so I ask you, what are you praying for most in this season of your life? What has gripped your heart? I don't get it twisted. There's absolutely nothing wrong with praying for things like marriage and kids and jobs and financial concerns. There's absolutely nothing wrong with these things. But the prayers that we often see in the scriptures are far different from the prayers that we pray with our mouths. One such prayer is the prayer that we're focusing on this weekend. Paul lays out for us in real, relevant, and really easy ways a template to help us grow in our prayer life. To ask and answer the question more specifically that's often asked, how do I pray in such a way that will get God's attention and yield results? Paul prays, first of all, that this church at Ephesus, this corporate body of Christ, this church that he pastors, he prays, first of all, that they would know God intimately. Look at what he says in verse 17. He prays that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious Father, may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation. Here it is, so that you can know him better. He prays that they would receive the spirit of wisdom and revelation. Because, friends, the reality is in order for us to live out our faith, we need to realize that reason and willpower are insignificant and irrelevant. Friend, there ought to come a point in our walk where we stop trying to philosophize God and strategize ministry and try to lean on best practices for how to reach God's people or to live out this faith life. And what we need, friends, is wisdom and revelation. Because remember, as believers, we don't walk by facts. We walk by faith. For somebody here, could that be the reason why you're frustrated in prayer? Because you've been trying to cognate God. Trying to fit him into your neat little box and try to figure out why he's doing what he's doing. And God is trying to get you to remember that while you're trying to figure this out, I have already worked it out. So Paul says, I pray. That you would receive, you all, y'all, in the language of those of us who are in the South, that y'all would get to know better, get to know God better, rather. I'm pushing this a little further because this is, in my estimation, the primary priority and petition of Paul's prayer. He doesn't pray that these believers live comfortable lives. He doesn't pray that they get the job that they want. He's not praying that they would avoid persecution or have the strength to resist the devil. He puts all of those prayer requests under one prayer request, and that's to know God better. That word know in the Greek is the term epignosis. It refers to far more than intellectual knowledge or a passing identification of a particular person or thing epignosis the term for know here in the Greek refers to an intimate recognition of one that is the result of frequent interactions and encounters with that person and I start thinking about this idea of epignosis or to know and it got me to thinking don't ask me how but it got me to thinking about how in the year of our Lord 2023 many of us pursue mates in our culture You see, the way that many in our current culture pursue mates has shifted. Y'all got to pray for me and pray that don't nothing happen to that girl who was just standing up here. Because if something happened to her, I am fresh out of luck. Because the game done changed. (laughs) Friend, there are many in our culture who who are now and have now turned into dating apps in an attempt to find the love of their lives. Or, if we're going to keep it 100, sometimes it's the love for the night, but that's neither here nor there. And while I'm not here to make a determination on whether or not this is the best approach to pursuing a mate, I only highlight it because I found it interesting that of the millions of people who use the over 1,500 dating apps and websites in the world, ain't none of them ever determined to settle down and spend the rest of their lives with somebody that they didn't know. Think about it. Let's just say hypothetically you're in the room and you're looking for a life partner. 
a mate, a spouse, and you go on one of these sites, it don't matter which one you go to, Black, Hinge, Bumble, Match, Our Time, Christian Mingle, FarmersOnly.com, it don't matter, take your pick. Here's what you're going to find. <laughs> you don't have to be lonely. Anyway, all right. <laughs> mm -hmm. Here's what's going to happen. You're going to find some people there who have interested you, that intrigued you. But as intriguing and interesting as these individuals may be, chances are you probably ain't going to run out of here and marry somebody just because they got the best written profile, would you? Of course not. Why? Because you don't know them. You may know about them. You may think that what you feel is intriguing or attractive. You may be fascinated by some of the facts that you find on the profile. You may be intrigued by them. But friends, you and I both know that you probably are not going to base your entire future just because you are intrigued by some facts that you found regarding somebody. And here's why. Because you know that the facts and the profile is not enough for you to determine if they're really worth the investment of your entire life. Because the profile is just the representation. And so it don't matter how beautifully written or well put together the profile is on any of these dating apps. That is going to intrigue you to want to spend more time with that person. And I'm convinced the same is true when it comes to our relationship with God. I pause and remind somebody here that you really can't say that you know God if he never becomes important enough for you to make intentional, intimate interactions with him. Now, don't get me wrong. I'm not suggesting that having intellectual knowledge is meaningless or of no consequence. But what I am suggesting here is that for many of us, the things that we've learned about God by now should have created enough interest in you to want to carve out more space, to want to get to know him better. Here's what I know, friends. One of the ways that you know you're growing in your faith is that when you pray, your motivation for praying is not just because you're desperate for something. No, you pray because you are desperate for somebody. And friends, that's what Paul is praying here for the church, that they not just individuals, would, but as a church rather, would in fact receive the wisdom and revelation of God to know God better. That they would allow the spirit to show them that God is not just a father who who legally adopted them into his family but to know God as a father who loved them enough to send our big brother to sacrifice his life for us Paul is praying here that their church would have a complete understanding of their position and possessions in Christ so that they can grasp the reality of all that Christ had done for them Paul is praying that they would not merely settle for a relationship with God that is based on intellect alone but that they would intentionally allow the spirit of God to provide them insight necessary to develop consistent interaction that leads to greater intimacy he prays that they would never be satisfied with the knowledge of God that they currently possess but that their current knowledge would in fact fuel them to want to pursue him all the more and here is why he prays the prayer because he understands that no matter how long you've been a Christian no matter how well you know the Bible, no matter how, no matter where rather you are on the spectrum of your Jesus journey, here's what Paul knows that you and I ought to always remember. There is infinitely more of Jesus Christ for us to know. Would you turn and tell somebody near you, you ain't seen nothing yet? No, God is trying to invite us to know him intimately because he understands that this is our deepest need. Here's the, but here's the sobering reality, friends. The fact that Paul is praying this prayer, that they grow to know God better, implies that in their current state, they have as much God as they want. 
I only highlight this because for some of us, this is why praying has become boring. And this is why prayer, uh, why we struggle to pray confidently and comfortably and consistently. It's because for some of us, we are only satisfied with what that great, uh, with, with, with a gentleman by the name of Wilbur Reese. He calls three dollars worth of God. Slow down and preach. We, we're trying to figure out for some of us how we can put eternity into a paper bag. For some of us, we want transaction, not transformation. So for some of us, as much as we got God, we, I'm sorry, as much as we have enough God to help us pay our bills or to help us raise these kids or to help us get out of our mama's house or to help make our dreams come true, then our mind, in our minds, we think we're living the life. And what God is trying to get us to understand this weekend is that there is so much more that I want you to experience. There's so much more that I want to give you. There's another side of myself that I want to expose to you. God says, I'm trying to love you deeper. I'm trying to deposit it more into your souls I'm trying to extend to you the opportunity to know me in ways that you have never known me before but it's going to require that you carve out time to passionately pursue my presence and not just my presence I don't know about you friends this is a great reminder and a good reason for us to pray in fact, this is a prayer that I'm praying ever since I started reading this text a few weeks ago. This is the prayer, at least for this season of my life, to know God better. And I don't just want to know him intellectually, but I want to know him intimately. Because I understand that the purpose of prayer is not merely to communicate what I need, but the purpose of prayer is to commune with Christ. I feel like preaching a little bit. Is there anybody here who can help me declare, I want to know God better. I want to know him greater. And I don't just want to know his plans and I don't just want to know his purpose and I don't just want to connect with him when I need protection or provision I want to know his person and I want to know his uh, perfections and I don't just want to know them in some passive or passing way no I want to know God perpetually and progressively in a more excellent and exceeding more surpassing and more superior more competent and confident way this is why I pray this is why I read the scriptures. This is why I turn my plate down. This is why I turned my TV off a couple weeks ago and logged off social media. This is why I'm getting up 15, 20 minutes earlier. This is why I'm in a small group. This is why I get up and come to worship. This is why I serve because I want to know God better. I want to expose my heart to the God of the universe because I understand that when I come to know God better I begin to understand myself better and I begin to understand the world better when I know God better I know my soul better and I discover why I had to endure certain seasons of suffering better when I know God better I understand why I had to struggle the way I had to struggle and fight like I had to fight and why God didn't let me die in the previous season but he kept me for such a time as this when I know God better so so here's my prayer would you spirit lead me where my faith is without borders let me walk on the waters wherever you will call me take me deeper that my feet will ever wonder and my faith will be made stronger in the presence of my savior because I want to know God better somebody shout I want to know God better want to know him better Paul prays we would know God intimately, but he also prays for godly illumination. I'm going to move through the rest of these rather quickly. He prays, verse 18, that the eyes of their hearts would be enlightened. That the eyes of their hearts would be illuminated. In other words, Paul is praying that their understanding of, things, of the things of God would increase. That as a church... And as individuals in the church, as an institutional church, that they, as they seek God intently, that they would be able to see God more intensely. 
hear what I just said? Paul prays that as they intently seek God, that they would intensely seek God. And friends, when you don't know what to pray for, I'm convinced this is a good prayer request to pray that God would illuminate the eyes of our hearts because Jeremiah 17 reminds us that our hearts are desperately wicked above all things and beyond cure. Friend, if there's any part of us that needs to be lit up right now, it ain't the glow of our face, it's the glow of our heart because the heart is the center and the seat of our will and our emotions. The heart is the place where we decide what we value and what values to live by and what direction that we gonna go in. The heart is what gives us direction for how we gonna live each day and what Paul is trying to get us to understand here is where we sit determines what we see. And for some of us, Paul says, the enemy has shut your eyes. He shut your eyes. And you need the Holy Spirit to open them. Somebody here, that's the prayer that you need to pray. That God would begin to do surgery on your heart. Because for far too long you've allowed the enemy to shut the eyes of your heart to the light of God's will and God's way. And you've been going through life over the last three years stumbling and bumbling, making one dumb choice after another. And as a consequence you've fallen and settled into sin cycles and sinful patterns. And you know you're breaking God's heart but you can't see your way out of the situation you're in. So often what we need friends is for God to do spiritual LASIK on the eyes of our heart and get rid of that spiritual cataract that makes it difficult for us to comprehend and understand the kind of life that God has called us to and so God says listen let me put my hands on your heart so that you can see me in ways that you've never seen me before somebody shout open the eyes of my heart Lord open the eyes of my heart Lord because I want to see you I want to see you high and lifted up shining in the light of your glory he prays that they would know God intimately. He prays that they would experience godly illumination. I'm moving. He prays to know God's intention. Paul says, I pray, still in verse 18, that the eyes of your hearts would be illuminated. Here's the line. In order that you may know the hope for which he has called you. In other words, Paul says, I'm praying that by knowing Jesus, that you would, we will, as a church, as individuals, discover the hope to which we have been called. And how that call is designed to affect radical change in our lives. Friend, can I remind you that God intends for you and I to live with hope. Somebody declare, I've got hope. Because I've got hope, it ought to change the way I experience life. Because I understand that when I talk about hope, I'm not just merely talking about wishful thinking. I'm not just hoping for the best and expecting the worst. No, this is not wishing that things are going to turn out the best. No, when I say I've got hope, listen to the language here. I'm saying I've got confident expectation. And when you read the text in context, you discover that the hope that Paul is referring to here is the hope of eternal salvation let me just put a quarter in the meter here and help somebody who's in the back you do realize that the hope of eternal salvation is in fact the reason for why you and I should always be the most hopeful people on the planet because we understand that the fact that God has called us and given us a sure and certain hope here's what that means it means that our past sins have been removed and our future reality has been received. Friend, we can live with certain assurance that because of the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, that those of us who have placed our faith in Jesus, God has called us out of darkness into the marvelous light. And because of that reality, even when it's time for us to stare death in the face, we may cry. We may grieve. We may hurt. 
But we don't grieve as those who don't have hope because we've got the confident assurance that if this earthly house of this tabernacle is dissolved, we've got another building of God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. Sure, if we come across somebody and experience death in our family or even death among some close friends, we may miss that person. Our hearts may be broken. But even through our tears, we find a reason to rejoice because we know that because of Christ, we've got a hope on earth that leads to a door and that door friend does not read exit but it reads enter friend remember there's more to this life than this life we've got the hope of eternal salvation but we also got hope for the situation that we experience friend when Paul prays this prayer for the church at Ephesus Understand that like many of us, they are facing some of the same pressures that we are facing. They're experiencing persecution. Many of them have literally had their families turn their backs on them. Life has grinded them down. They've become exhausted trying to live out this Christ-like way. Many of them have become lonely and they were struggling with whether or not they were going to commit to Jesus or live the life that they were used to. And so Paul prays that the Ephesians will understand that they're hope. And to understand that this is a hope that will not disappoint and not let them down. Because I said a minute ago, God intends for you and I to live in hope. And here's what that means. It means that this hope is a hope that is the sure and settled confidence in God's future plans. That's based on God's past performance despite my present predicament what go back say it again v when we talk about hope it is the sure and settled confidence in god's future plans based on god's past performances despite my present circumstances in other words despite what might be trying to take my hope i can walk around with confidence assurance and certainty that god will do simply because i've got receipts of what God did do. I felt that in the Holy Ghost. I can walk with hope. Knowing that God will do. Because of the fact that I've got receipts of what God did do. So I don't have to trip out when life is trying to break me down. Because I know God will be faithful because God has been faithful. I know God will provide because God has provided. I know God will heal my body because I've got evidence of people around me. Even if this is the first time I've been sick, I've got enough evidence around me of what God did do. And I'm pushing toward the close. But friends, one of the best ways that you and I know we're growing in our walk with God is when you and I can maintain our hope and hold on to the assurance that when you come to God in prayer that God will fulfill every promise that he made in his word would you do me a favor turn to somebody near you and tell them keep hope alive keep hope alive this is why friends we've got to as a church and as individuals pray this prayer of hope because life on this side is too fickle is too fragile is too damning is too depressing and we need an anchor for our souls and hope is what anchors our souls because while you may be able to live 40 days without food you've heard this four days without water four minutes without oxygen you and I cannot live one second without hope. Turn to somebody and tell them, keep hope alive. So he prays that we would come to know God as a church, as individuals, in our walk with him, that we would come to know God intimately. That we would have our eyes illuminated. That we would know God's intention, but he also prays that we would know our God-given identity. I'm still in verse 18. PC, this is why you got to be careful to give me two weeks in advance, because I just, I'll be digging and digging and digging and digging. Uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm right here still in verse 18. Paul says that the eyes of your heart may be eliminated in order that you may know, here it is, the riches of his glorious inheritance. Now, friends, when you and I talk about often the inheritance and the riches of God in the scriptures, 
for many of us, our first inclination is to think about the riches that we receive from God. But that's not what Paul is talking about here. That's not the point that Paul is making here. When you look at verse 18 and you look at it in the original language, here's the way it's written. It's written to suggest not that we are receiving an inheritance, but that the reality is we are the inheritance. That, that, that inheritance here is actually referring to our identity. That you a God's inheritance. Listen to what God says to you. And I need this to hit you on the top of your head real good. God says, I've made you my prized possession. That I put you in my portfolio and made you a part of my net worth. Did you hear what I just said? God said, I saw you, looked at you, and thought that you were worth putting in my portfolio and don't get it twisted he does so pastor Clark not because we are so wonderful or because we just shot up like a good stock but God says I did it in spite of the fact that I knew that you were more of a bear stock than a bull stock but when I looked at you I saw something of value in you and I decided to put you in my portfolio and if you can't give God praise for nothing else that's something to give God praise for that sometimes God sees you far more significantly than you see yourself so, so in some villages in, in Africa, Big Sister Denise, whenever a man wants to marry a young lady, it's customary that the man would pay a dowry to the father, who would in turn grant this gentleman permission to marry his daughter. In one such village, a rather handsome man came into that village, goes to the father to ask for one of his daughter's hands in marriage. Now, here's what's interesting about the woman that he was interested in, Cal. She was ugly. She, she, she wasn't all that beautiful, and, um, and she couldn't cook. <laughs> now, let me tell you why that's significant. Really, it's that significant because the average price for a daughter's hand in marriage was three cows in that village. Three cows. That was what the going rate for marriage was. If she could cook, it would go up to five. But this woman, she ugly and she can't cook. But the man asks the father for a hand in marriage. He goes to the father to negotiate this dowry price. Now, because nobody wanted this woman, there were some in the village who began to speculate that the man who expressed interest was trying to haggle the father down to one cow. And the daddy, knowing that didn't nobody want this woman, was okay with giving her, his daughter away for one cow. But interestingly enough, Miss Joyce, this gentleman didn't do that. In fact, he did something that even the father didn't expect. He marched up to the woman's father, and instead of offering the customary three cows, and even instead of Offering the extravagant number of five cows. He decided to put them together and offer eight cows for this ugly woman who couldn't cook. They get married. And after the wedding, something strange started to happen. This ugly woman who couldn't cook learned how to cook. She started walking around with her head a little high. Decided to put on makeup and make sure her hair was done. Her eyes started to sparkle a little more. She started putting some stuff on her skin. That was a grace and a poise about her. And she began to beam with an inner glow. Because once she realized that she was worth eight cows, she wanted to make sure that her identity matched the level of his investment. I'm moving. But can I remind somebody that that's what God did for you and me when he played the ultimate price to make sure that we were in his portfolio. And when he paid the price, he didn't pay for us in cows. He paid for 
for us on a cross and because he paid for you you are worth something to him I feel preaching right up in my pinky toe you are God's prized possession you've got an estimable value you are no cheap knockoff fake out version of nobody no you are a chosen generation help me preach here a royal priesthood a holy nation and a peculiar people look at somebody and tell them remember who you are and friends this is why you can't do everything that you want to do and say everything you want to say this is why you can't go everywhere you want to go because God has invested too much in you to play yourself cheap and to settle for low level living you ain't average you're amazing you ain't broken you're beautiful you're fearfully and wonderfully made because you ma'am you sir are a part of God's portfolio and a part of his inheritance I'm All right, y'all sit down. I got, I got a little bit more to go. Got a little bit more to go. I promise you we're going there together. Here's the last thing I got. Here's the last thing I got. He says, when you pray, pray for godly intimacy. Pray for illumination. Pray for God's intention. Pray to embrace your godly identity. Finally, he says, when you pray, he prays for this church at Ephesus. We're praying for this church at Greater Mount Zion for an infusion of God's power. I'm at the end of the verse here. Paul says, I pray that you'll be able to see his, here it is, incomparably great power for us who believe. That power, somebody shout that power. It's the same power as the mighty strength that he exerted when he raised Christ from the dead. In other words, Paul says, pray for the supernatural power. That's what you was talking about a minute ago, PC. That enables us to live not in turmoil, but in triumph. And here's what I love about that power. It's power that's extraordinary. Paul says, this is not some regular power. No, this is resurrection power. It's the kind of power that will snatch victory from the jaws of defeat. It's the power to shatter shame. It's the power to not be overwhelmed by obstacles. It's a power to come back from mistakes. It's power to give you deliverance over temptation and break the back of sin in your life. Friend, can I remind you that you don't just have regular power. You've got resurrection power. And because it's resurrection power, it's extraordinary power. It's power to be effective. Can I tell you, you've got power, friends, to make a difference. It's the type of power that makes you and I catalyst for change. It's the type of power that speaks those things that are not as though they already are. It's the kind of power that can, as Jesus says, bind things on earth that are bound in heaven and loose things on earth that are loosed in heaven. It's the power to live godly. Knowing that by his power, he has given us everything that we need for life and godliness. It's the power, hear me, to look at something negative in our world and speak truth to power, speak truth rather, to the powers that attempt to oppress us. It's the power to witness for Jesus. It's the power to be salt in tasteless situations. And it's the power to be light in life's darkest circumstances. It's the power to be creative and courageous knowing that God has left us here to be the solution to the problem that we are experiencing you ain't got regular power we've got resurrection power power to be effective power that's extraordinary and it's also power to emerge I'm done here the resurrection Denise reminds us that there's absolutely nothing that we will go through that we can't come back from. <laughs> Did you hear what I said? The resurrection is a reminder that we've been given strength and capacity to emerge from any stressful situation, any sorrow, any sickness, and any sadness with God's power. That's why Jesus had to come out the grave and be raised on the third day because he knew in 2023 that greater Mount Zion would need a model of what it looks like for when life tries to kill us to be able to recognize that no matter what you're dealing with and no matter how much pressure you 
wonder you too can emerge from that which is trying to take you down can I remind somebody that no matter how dark life may be for you every good Friday has to give way to the triumphant beat of resurrection drums would you help me close the sermon I'm ready for you now would you look at somebody and tell them I've got the power no encourage them now and tell them you've got the power and it ain't no regular power it's resurrection power and because you've got that power you don't have to settle for life as it is when you've been empowered with the power to shift and change because you've got that power you can allow the scars of your past to make a contribution into your future because you've got that same power that raised Jesus from the dead at work in your life I came to remind somebody who stopped praying because you've been gripped by fear and insecurity and you feel like you are powerless to change what you're going through can I remind somebody that God's power is sufficient for your needs and because you've got that power the very thing you thought wasn't possible has now become possible why don't you help me close the sermon is there anybody here who can give God praise for that power I know you feel weak right now but you've got the power I know you feel overwhelmed but you've got the power so because you got that power stop talking about what you can't do what you can't accomplish what we can't achieve what you can't become what you can't do because the last time I checked I can do come on church me all through Christ who strengthens me so pray for that power seize that power snatch that power walk in that power live in that power lead in that power giving that power serving that power cause he's giving you power somebody tap yourself on the chest and tell him I've got power and not just to do things again but to do them better to be more focused and faithful to be more involved and intentional to deepen my confidence and my compassion I've got power to be more responsive and more resilient and more resolute I've got power to be deliberate and determined decisive and dynamic to discover that no matter how hard the journey may get I've got what it takes to make look good even when life is going bad is there anybody here who can help me praise God for his power thank you father for your power for it has resurrected me over painful circumstances that my poor soul cannot flee if you're grateful for the power given praise walk around as a weakling I don't have to let the circumstances of my life shape my life I've got power and this ain't no regular power it's the same power that got Christ out the dead all right I'm done but we finna pray as I think about as I thought about how to shape this time of prayer I was reading Tim Keller's book, Prayer, and in it he shares a conversation that he has with his, his wife during a very critical time and season in their lives. Put some more on the monitors. I can't hear myself, guys. He's, he's having a conversation with his wife. His wife is battling Crohn's disease. He's got a diagnosis of cancer. It's right after 9-11, and his wife has this struck of genius to ask her husband who's a pastor to pray with her every day and here's how she got him to commit 
She said to her husband, imagine that you were diagnosed with a lethal disease that doctors told you that you would die within hours unless you took a particular medicine every night. Would you forget to take that medicine? She asked her husband, who is a pastor, would you forget? Would you allow life to run you up and down in such a way that you all of a sudden forget to take the medicine? No. Why? Because it would be crucial to your survival. Because you knew that it was crucial to your survival, you wouldn't forget to take it. And I think this is why you're calling us to prayer, Pastor Clark. Because um, the future of this church, future of this community, the future of your family, the future of this city lies in our capacity to carve out time to be with God. John Piper put it this way, and I'm, I'm, I'm going to let us pray in just a minute. He said prayer should be like a wartime walkie-talkie. Not an intercom where you call your butler to fluff your pillow. He said, because prayer is urgent. Really is a matter of life and death. So this is why we're being called to prayer. I know we've been inspired and I know much of the angle of the sermon had angles of me. But remember Paul prays this prayer for the church. So more than me, it's about we. Do you realize that the future of the person whose hand or the person you're sitting next to lies in your capacity to pray? And when you don't pray they may be in a season of weakness, and all it requires is a prayer from you. Friend, it's about we, not me. Can you imagine what this church would be like if all of us committed to praying? Could you imagine what we could do in the city for the glory of God? Could you imagine, friends, how many people on your job would actually believe you are a Christian? That was slightly shady. I apologize. <laughs> so here's what I want us to do. We're getting ready to go. I know I've kept you longer than I had to. But I want us to pray. And I gave us five areas for which we can pray. Much similar to what Pastor Clark invited us to do. I want you to find one. And I want you even now to begin to pray. I pray for you. You pray for me. I love you. I need you to. You got yours. You can start praying. I won't harm you with words from my mouth. I love you. you you're used to it now. Go on and start praying. Open up your mouth and say something to it. I pray for you. You pray for me. I love you. I won't harm you with words from my mouth. I love you. I need you to survive. I pray for you. You pray for me. I love you. I need you to So God, as my brothers and sisters are continuing to pray to you, I pray that you would grant us favor, bend in our direction, bend in the direction of 4301 Tannehill, and hear our prayer. And would you show us the very next step that we need to take today? to see your answer to the prayer that we just prayed. 
become reality in our lives. And that we would be motivated not just because we're desperate for something, but that the motivation for our prayer would be that because we are desperate for someone. We need you, God. And we ain't trying to make it without you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, if you're glad you came to church and grateful for the word that God spoke to you, come on, why don't you give him praise all over the church? Before we leave, ladies and gentlemen, for somebody here, you've been praying all day, but you hadn't prayed the most important prayer, which is the prayer of salvation. Friends, can you, if you don't mind, we all finna go home in just a minute. So unless you just leave and to go to work right now, if you can honor the fact that we're still in a spirit of worship, that would be most amazing. For somebody here, let me tell you why I made the, the comment I just made. Because for somebody here, eternity is in the balance for them. And I want to invite somebody to pray the most important prayer that you will ever pray in your life which is to ask God to forgive you of your sins and to come into your life. Friend, if you don't know Jesus as Savior and leader, all this stuff that we've been talking about all day, you'll appreciate it, but it won't mean nothing to you because you hadn't taken care of first things first. So if you're in this room and you want to say yes to the Lord Jesus Christ, we've got counselors, members who are part of our decision team, Room 145 after the worship experience is over with. Man, grab all your stuff. We're going to pray in just a minute and make yourself. You can meet us over here to my left and your right. If you want to be a part of this church, this institution, bigger than the institution, this community, this community of faith, we'd love to be your brothers and sisters in the faith. Our pastor would absolutely love to be your pastor. On site room 145 you too can make those same decisions if you are watching online all you got to do is dial a number that's on the screen 877-632-0702 I'm convinced there are at least five of you today who want to say yes to the Lord Jesus Christ I know it do not leave without saying yes to the Lord Jesus Christ today We'd love to see you over here, or we'd love to take your phone call. If you want to give, of course, you're more than welcome to give. We understand that we don't necessarily carve our time in this worship experience to talk about giving. But understand, giving is of significant import because it's impossible. It's woefully just flat out wrong to not give anything to the God who has given you everything. And so for somebody here, part maybe, I don't know, maybe call to knowing God intimately at another level might be attached to you giving to him regularly you want to start that today you can give on the way out we've got offering boxes at each of the exits well I'm convinced God met us here today and uh, I hope it encourages you more than encouraging you I hope and pray that this would be nailed into your heart that one of those prayer principles would be nailed into your reality as we leave from this place Look at somebody near you and tell them, have a strong week. Yeah, have a strong week because you got power. You got power. You got power. As we leave from this place, I pray that God will bless you and keep you, that God would make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. I pray that God will lift the light of his countenance around each of you, and I pray unto every one of your blessed lives that you will experience the peace, the power, more importantly than anything, the presence of God in a real way this week. In Jesus' name we pray. And all of God's children said together, amen. We love you. May the peace of God be yours. We'll see you next week.